Hey everyone, Eric Watson here, freelance writer, player of games, writer of boards, recorded videos, and tabletop role-playing aficionado. Welcome to the Monday edition of my bi-weekly behind-the-scenes DM-only livestream crafting the deep, which I build right and prepare for next session of Call from the Deep. If you're playing characters Gotwald, Max, Sabra, or Twirl, this video is not meant for you and we full of spoilers. But the rest of you are welcome. We stream our D&D sessions live on YouTube every Friday. You can join our official Discord server with invite link in the description below. If you'd like to support the channel, please check out patreon.com slash roguewatson. For our campaign, we use Roll20. And for streaming, I use OBS Studio. Hope everyone is doing well. Oh my goodness, CMG. Thank you so much for the super chat. I appreciate you. Um, we had to pivot last week. I choke on my words. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> That's something crawling in my throat. We had to pivot last week, which means I did not have to think or plan anything. God, what is in my throat right now? Not like I have to talk right now. It's great timing. Oh my gosh. This weather is playing hell on all of us. <clears throat> Hang on, I gotta cough a good one. Okay. Start grabbing all the liquids I have within arm's reach. My goodness. All right, let's take it from the top once again. Let's roll the tape back. <laughs> what I was trying to say is that we had to pivot last week uh, because of a reduced party. And so we had an emergency planning for a whole different kind of session than I was planning. So now I need to get back onto the other lane and resume talking about the next step of our actual main story campaign, which means I still have, like, no notes. <laughs> Hashtag no notes. It's like no scope for D&D. &D. Uh, on the Sawagan Stronghold, I just, yeah, I had to shelve everything and start and started prepping uh, last week's session. So back onto this one. But still, we still have, like, half of the session is going to be a level up, right? So it's always, like, the first, the first session of the next quest arc, uh, usually goes a bit slower, right? Because we have a big level up session. We have some like downtime activities, although frankly, <clears throat> I'm still getting over my throat. Uh, you know, Mac and Sabra kind of had that downtime activity, I guess, when they took over this base of operations, which I actually love. I did not expect them to be able to take over that tower as a new base of operations, but uh, you know, it kind of makes sense at their level, they'd be able to swing their proverbial swords around a little bit and, take over the, the new tower base for them in Neverwinter. Although, as fun as the idea that is, you know, a lot of campaigns, we actually don't take advantage of having a singular base of operations and then letting the players go out and do these, like, uh, you know, adventures of the week or month or whatever and then always go back to their thing. It's like, usually you're, you have uh, your, I guess, one town, but then you just leave that town forever, right? Tomb of Annihilation, we never went back to Port Knight, and that's not true. We did go back to Port Knight, there like once. Uh, and in Rhyme, I guess we did go back to Bryn Chander at some point. But, like, here we did go back to Neverwinter, right? Like, we, we left, we started off in Neverwinter technically, and then, like, in Session 0, and then we returned to Neverwinter in whatever it was, Session, like, 16 or something, uh, and then went did a quest and then came back to Neverwinter. And now, I think at this point, once we leave Neverwinter, which is going to happen this coming session, I don't see the players ever actually making it back there because I mean if we just look at all the next quests that are coming up the final enemy slash Sawagan stronghold is going to be to the south by a couple days travel they can continue on to do the styes and Orlamor, which is even further to the south and then they already know the location of Sea King Tentrix is down here in the Nalanthor Isles which is all the way at the south so unless they want to go all the way back north to Neverwinter or I can come up with some excuse in the teleport or something, they would just go to Purple Rocks uh, across the entire sea. But maybe they'll want to go to Neverwinter first, stop there and check up on stuff before the final thing. That, that might be a good idea. Um, I still don't have a good way of like teleporting that far because normally when a game has you doing this where it's like you're going further and further and further away, you're like going in a U-shape or a circle or some way you can contrive going back there or you just never, ever go back there. Um, I don't know what's going to happen in this case. But for now, we're going to talk about... I don't know what we're going to talk about. Um, I don't think we're going to make it to the Swagin Stronghold yet. Because uh, I I feel like we need to have an encounter going from Neverwinter to wherever the hell I want to 
I, I could move it. I could even move the Swaggin Stronghold still. We haven't gone back to this map screen. It's it's wherever I want it to be. But I think this is still the best place for it, which is kind of south. Uh, the Mayor of Dead Men, the Red Rocks area. Kind of between Neverwinter and Waterdeep, but closer to Waterdeep. It, it makes sense that the Swaggin would have a base somewhere on the coast, and, that, and that's a major problem. And... I don't know, it just feels like a decent region. And that way you don't, they don't have to throw a lot of encounters at them. But then once they... Although the other argument made is like, are they really sailing across the ocean? Like we've got all of this ocean map that I'm really not taking advantage of right now. Right? Like we went to Gunderland and came back. That felt kind of newbie-ish. And they were never went to her for a while. Now we're just going to go along the coast again. Although we're still going to do a, a water-themed dungeon here. It's just right off the coast. And then we go south, we're off the coast again to do the styes. So I'm kind of disappointing myself with me not using more of the outer area. I can maybe encourage them to go to Mintarn, uh, kind of a pirate outpost there, and maybe chat with the pirates. Hopefully use, I don't know how to use Moonshade Isles at all. This is the unfortunate part of this campaign, I'll be honest. This chapter three was always going to be tricky to wrap my head around because this is not how I like to do D&D campaigns or adventures i do not like the big open world even though i love open world video games right like i love that concept that's so much fun like give me the zelda the skyrims whatever fallouts assassin creeds like i love that stuff in video games to an extent <laughs> i will say they can get too big a horizon god horizon series is so fucking amazing but in D, &D when i need to set everything up and Put it on a virtual tabletop and put tokens on the board and everything. I don't think it works as well. And I think me and my players both appreciate a more memorable and structured story versus just, hey, what do you want to go do kind of a thing. So, like, obviously, I, I can take advantage of having quests around a map. We've done that in all my campaigns I've run. And I still plan on doing that here. And that's really what chapter three will kind of be good for. But then I was like, well, let's just insert some of Ghosts of Saltmarsh here. And then that sort of just takes up all these locations that I would need in chapter three into big, big, you know, singular dungeon locations. That's one thing that I feel like this campaign lacked a little bit. I do love my dungeon crawls. Uh, and we really haven't been able to do that too much in this campaign. I think the Wreck of the Golden Crown... And Bronzo Mine, probably the closest thing we've had to dungeon crawls. Nothing in Pirate Skyhold was really a dungeon crawl. Um, Sinister Secret of Saltmarsh started off with one. I get, with, Again, that's from Ghost of Saltmarsh and, uh, and Savage Operation. But again, that's from Ghost of Saltmarsh. So that's really what I'm doing is I, I looked at Call from the Deep and thought, okay, I need more dungeons in my Dungeons and Dragons. So that's and, and that's where Ghost of Saltmarsh really shines is every single one of those adventures is a dungeon crawl because that's just classic. D&D is every single module was centered around a dungeon crawl. And I use the term dungeon loosely. A dungeon can be a shipwreck, right? A dungeon can be a forest. It's a, a dungeon to me doesn't literally mean some underground place. It just means here is a centralized location in which the players move around room to room versus the DM like ex like montaging you through travel. That gets us from point A to point B, but then once we get to point B, I want to have the players take the reins and let them move around and explore. So that's why I like to use all the dungeon stuff. Mac was stuck in Big Mac mode the whole time. That's interesting. I didn't realize that was a a side effect of the potion of growth. It's like an Alice in Wonderland thing where you need like the opposite. You need to be able to eat some sweets or something to to de biggin, <laughs> not in biggin, but de biggin, because it didn't. It said it didn't require concentration, and so he's like, oh, I'm stuck big. For like two hours, which then of course we have to make the the Viagra joke or whatever. <laughs> At least one more dragon. I'm gonna work on that. Uh, you know, a lot, and I've seen the joke before, where Dungeons and Dragons often does not have very many dragons. It's like several dungeons and maybe one dragon is really like the joke of the title. I think I think in our campaigns we probably average like one dragon per campaign. I'm trying to think if I'm gonna because I and, and the one I used here is not even central to the campaign, but I made sure to want to use him. 
Hopefully we get a chance to fight a dragon at some point. I don't know if I can swing that. Does a dragon turtle count? Because uh, Does a zombie dragon turtle count? Because I think we are going to use the zombie dragon turtle later on. And that that's what I was going to have be the tease that was actually guarding the Nelanthar Isles. There's a really great bit. Um, I think it must be in chapter 4 maybe. Where it talks about a zombie dragon turtle that's like being commanded by like a wizard in a tower. Like, I can run with that like crazy. That'd be awesome as a defense thing. So just this powerful Godzilla-type creature that's running through here. And the players can either try to fight it straight up or more than likely it attacks and they have to, like, run. And maybe they can figure out to get to this tower somehow. Like, I don't know what's going to happen, but that's that's for a future session. We have a Banshee or a Hydra. I do like Hydras. I think we I used a Hydra in tomb and it ended up being really disappointing i forgot what level the players were i think they were like eight or nine it was a hydra and the faint of the night serpent and they were even like split i don't think they even had the whole party with them so i do like the idea of a hydra though <laughs> always uh but speaking of like a hydra or a swamp creature like i am thinking about okay we need to get the players to the sawagan stronghold uh, we need to do some story stuff to get them there, which means they need to take the ship, go down to... Well, first of all, it's their Triton ally from that's already on their ship that's basically going to tell them the information they need. Where she'll be like, hey, uh, you know, my job was to... Uh, I was sent by Gillian as a Triton emissary to go uh, see... We've heard that the lizard folk, you know, they sent out like... I don't know, SOS calls or something. Maybe they're lizard folk in good standing with some of the rest of the aquatic community. And asking for, like, help because a large Sawagan force just destroyed them, demolished, you know, their uh, leadership and sent them reeling and took over their entire island lair. And uh, that's what... And, and maybe that's all she knows. Maybe she wasn't able to follow up on that because she then you know, got caught by the salt marsh crew on the way down there. So, but she would at least know like the general location and things about what's going on, but maybe she wouldn't know a, a, an update and that allows the players to kind of stumble into the situation. On the other hand, I need them to be able to converse with the lizard folk. So at this point, I'm kind of using elements of one of the ghosts of salt marsh adventures that I'm not really going to use, but that's Danger at Dunwater, and kind of as a precursor to the final enemy, which makes sense because the original Saltmarsh trilogy was Sinister, Secret, then Danger at Dunwater, and then Final Enemy. I did not like the adventure Danger at Dunwater, though. I think it's really weird. It's uh, kind of a bait and switch where you think lizard folk are the enemy, and then they give you this whole big dungeon, and then you get to the end, you just talk to the queen, and then you just... You shouldn't like kill any. It's just, it's a very odd odd setup. I couldn't quite wrap my head around it, but I like the idea of like the lizard folk tribe. Basically, I like the the backstory of the Sawagan stronghold, where the lizard folk were uh, thrown out of their lair by the Sawagan, and, the, and thus the players are working with. I realize I'm we literally just did the lizard folk angle with the pirate sky hold thing. Had I been a little more prescient, I might have changed them to something else like. Probably not Grung, because Raymond's got to think about Grung, but Bullywugs or something. Like, I probably should have changed it. I know that in the original Pirate Skyhold, and it's mentioned that, you know, his, he's got lizard folk up there. But this adventure isn't, in, uh, this final enemy isn't in Call from the Deep. So I, I should have changed the lizard folk there, because they are, lizard folk are, uh, again, featured prominently in uh, this adventure. And I realize we're just doing them. Back to back, so whoops. <laughs> uh, not that we can't have multiple lizard folk tribes, but with all the different myriad of creatures, I probably could have changed it. I could have changed this one, but I think I already mentioned that early on in the adventure that that was the uh, the Triton's deal and with the lizard folk and stuff. So I don't really think I can retcon that too easily. I'm I need to still talk to Heather and see if she wants to be originally from this lizard folk tribe because that might make things a little different too. And these should be, um, you know more, uh, I don't know, civilized or diplomatic lizard folk, I think, would be nice. And, you know, certainly the party has no qualms about working with all kinds and all manners of creatures from all walks of life as they have 
uh, talk to bandits and dragons and I'm, I'm sure oh an undead um wizard at the bottom of the sea <laughs> like all kinds of creatures they've been able to ally with unless you steal from sava sovra then they fucking kill you i think it does have undead fortitude actually um nate the uh the, what is it? The zombie dragon turtle? Is it under Z for zombie? D for... Nope, there it is. Yep. Zombie dragon turtle with undead fortitude. By the way, we just did a... Uh, our Baldur's Gate session. We we played another session finally last night after like three weeks off. And we fought a bunch of zombies with undead fortitude. And it was really pissing me off till I think we figured out that in Baldur's Gate, I don't think they roll for it. Or maybe they do and they just don't show it. But I think we figured out they just give all zombies one success of undead fortitude. And after that, they go down to zero. So it just averages out where I guess they always survive one hit. Which at that point, you basically got relentless endurance of the half-orc trait. But yeah, that's pretty hilarious. You could even argue that like maybe... The dragon turtle keeps getting resurrected, and that's why you can't defeat it until you go to the tower. So that could be a fucking cool move, right? They're like, they're trying to get into the Nelanthor Isles. This dragon turtle comes up. They have this big fight to destroy it. Then they're like, all right, now we can continue on. All of a sudden, they see the tower, like, shoot a beam of light at the dragon turtle, and it starts, like, moving and reanimating and reconstituting. They're like, oh, fuck. <laughs> that is a cool idea. And that would motivate them to be like, we got to get to that tower and shut this thing down or this dragon's literally never going to stop just coming back to life and killing us. That would be fantastic. I like that idea. AC, or uh, CR11. Not super, super powerful, but the players, and the players will probably be like level 8 or 9 by the time they get down to fighting it, so... But they're going to be on a boat, so that'll be tricky. This thing could probably just swim around and use its freezing breath and do terrible things. the The worst part is they would be they would it would just destroy their boat like real quick. So that could also change things. If I ever actually pull the trigger and want to destroy their ship, that would be the place to do it because then I could force them. Story wise, they would be like, "All right, well now we just got to continue like swimming and deal with the islands in a different way." And then I would have to contrive some way for them to be able to teleport either back to Neverwinter or directly to Purple Rocks, and thus their ship travels actually end by the time they get to Nelanthor Isles. That would be interesting too. And we're getting ahead of things talking about this, but this is also the best way to get these ideas. Strava was the weird goth girl at the local lizard folk high school. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> and look at her now. Meanwhile, the captain of the Lizard Folk football team is still there working for his dad's uh, used uh, what's a, a giant lizard. <laughs> My analogies are falling apart. <laughs> trying to think of what the Lizard Folk equivalent of a car would be. Uh, do they ride giant lizards? That's kind of weird. That'd be like if we rode gorillas or something. I don't know. What do lizard folk usually ride as as mounts? <laughs> they always have to pair the creature with like their the just unsentient version of the creature. Like bullywugs and grungs are riding giant frogs. Also kind of weird. I don't know. <laughs> if we rode gorillas, we'd be fucking unstoppable, though. That's the real story. We should have just humans riding gorillas. It's not weird at all. 15d6 is pretty ow. Damnix, hello. Thank you. I try. <laughs> it was fun. Thank you. Thankfully, I've got great players. So, Clax had a giant lizard. Is, yeah, why is, why do we do that? <laughs> Minotaurs don't ride like bulls, do they? I'm going off on a whole tangent now. I know that like bullywugs and grung creatures tend to ride frogs. Maybe it's just lizards like to ride with their own kind. UNT don't really ride snakes. It'd be really weird. They have snake tails though, which is kind of like that. <laughs> Odd. How do we get the party to talk to the lizard folk in the swamp if they don't know that they're there? 
So we may have to already give them that information. Because otherwise they wouldn't they won't know where to go. They would only the only thing that the Triton would know would be like where's the base at, and thus they would just go to the base and that would skip the lizard folk. So she's gonna have to And I really need to figure out her backstory. Maybe she's already met with them. And then she was sent I don't know where to get help somewhere or just maybe maybe she met with them and was going to go report back after meeting with them and that's when she got captured report back to like Gillian that could work basically what I want to do is is have the players um meet with the lizard folk because I like the part I guess it's actually final enemy that it's, that I'm talking about not danger Dunwater yeah the council of war Uh, the meeting is also attended by several members of each faction that has allied with Salt Marsh against the Swagan. Unless the party's actions the previous adventure drove any potential allies, the following representatives are present. Which I think I'm going to ignore the others and just focus purely on the Lizard Folk. We can even use these names, Garut and Vyth. Both cool names, actually. I will have to change the plan here, which we talked about that previously. That it won't be just a reconnaissance mission for the party. Instead, it will be a uh, kind of a like a Navy SEALs operation where, okay, there's a fortified enemy base and your job is to infiltrate it, get inside, take out the leadership, cut the head of the snake off, uh, rescue people. And possibly find a way to reverse the fact that the entire island has been sunk in there. Which we do get a little picture right here, I guess, of the Swagen Stronghold. Just look like a rocks jutting out of the water. If, if I'm going to go that direction, I'm not sure. But certainly at least take out the leadership and rescue people. Which I think will force them to go to the two bottom layers, which are the underwater portions of the dungeon. But the nice thing is, what I want them to do is meet with the lizard folk, and the lizard folk can then give them the information, and including... Uh, shoot, where is it? I put it somewhere. There was a drawing I got from the Discord. Uh, maybe put it under player handouts. Yeah, here it is. So this was actually, like, the original one from the like original module, apparently this is the drawing the lizard folk give the party. So it's only partially correct. But I love that idea, right? That's like that the heist idea where like you can give them limited information or information that's even outdated, but it's still better than going into a dungeon blind. So I definitely I don't want to skip the part where they meet with the lizard folk and get like the information they need in the overall layout. And also what I'm annoyed by with Ghosts of Saltmarsh is they don't tell you how do the players get into this base. They just assume all of the enemies are just sitting in the dungeon with their thumbs up their asses, like just waiting for adventurers to come in and infiltrate the place. That's not a, at all how I see this. I see this as being, you know, the fucking Mordor or something, which is like tr patrols and enemies everywhere. And like, you got to get inside. So like, how do you get in? You either have to be a small, small team, which is like, you know, the joke about, oh, well, the, all of us can't assault, you know, us lizard folk can't assault the area because we'll be taken out an instant. The Sawagan rule the water and our base is unfortunately like just off the coast. But perhaps a small team can, uh, you know, infiltrate, do the uh, trench run and shoot the missiles into the open vent and then take out the Death Star. And then the lizard folk can be like, well, we can... Uh, prepare like a, a distraction and, and faint like an attack and then that will allow the rest of you to actually get inside and then what I could play with is having the players have like an encounter or two like just on their way to the lizard folk not really I don't want to drag it out too long because the dungeon is plenty huge and I don't I don't want to do like a big swamp dungeon crawl that's not really my intention here but it, it might be worth doing something fun just to kind of show that those are folk are in like not good shape here in the swamp land <clears throat> unfortunately thornhold i don't think really helps me this is like a castle on the coast 
Um, if the players want to visit it, I guess they can. It's kind of a safe zone. And maybe maybe just going to Thornhold, well, that could save me uh, from having the Triton give them too information. The Triton can be like, well, let's, you know, last I heard they were trying to, uh, they had escaped to the nearby castle of Thornhold. I'm not sure if Thornhold would let them in or anything. And so we need to check them out first. So maybe they can go to Thornhold first. And then Thornhold can be like, yeah, we don't have any... Actually, I don't think they have room for lizard folk. Go out into the swamps. I also really like the legendary crocodile uh, hunt that's in Chapter 3. Uh, but I'm still waffling on whether I want to use it or not. It is the uh, epilogue croc hunt. Thousand Teeth, which is a unique legendary crocodile with... Or alligator, I guess. It says crocodile, but I assume I assume swamps are alligator, right? Because crocodiles are more saltwater. Let's look at the snout, see if it's pointy or not. <laughs> Thousand Teeth's pool. There are some encounters in here I could draw from as well, but this is all for third level, so I don't know if that would make sense, but um, it might be too much of an encounter for in here. As long as the lizard folk get slaughtered in a horrific way. Oh dear. Why are we slaughtering the lizard folk? Probably also what you going to do when I'm ready the campaign. The lizard folk ambush the players, but then stop halfway through and realize they're not the target. So do like a classic... Um... Oh, I say classic and I can't think of an eye... Um that trope, but you're like being, I mean, it, well, it happens in superhero comic book all the time where like somebody shows up uh, and they get into a fight like immediately and then they realize, wait, I'm just here to talk or I'm not actually here to fight you. And then they stop fighting. <laughs> but in this case, it would be like, you're going out to meet a, uh, a tribe of people that you have no previous diplomatic relations with. And they would be obviously apprehensive of that. But maybe that's something that'd be a cool twist for Savra if she was part of the tribe, and then she can be like, "All right, wait, slow your roll," and the, and of course the you know chief is like her brother or something. I, don't know, I can make something fun with that. So that 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 idea definitely has merit. Still feel like I want to couch that around an encounter, maybe. We could have fun with that. A caiman. What's the what's the kind of croc? Isn't there one that has like a really long, weird snout too? Is that caiman? Or is that something else? Those are, those are crazy looking. I do like that idea though for the first meeting. I, I initially thought of maybe having them in the middle of a common encounter and having those folks bail them out of that encounter. Like they come in and uh, which I've done that before in a lot of games. In fact, uh, Brandon, I used that in our Empire of the Ghouls campaign. Whenever uh, it was a swamp encounter, in fact, it was a swamp encounter against I forget what they were, some kind of gorilla monsters, and then the like nearby Valkyrie tribe like showed up and kind of helped drive off like the second one, and that was your meeting with them or something. So I do like that idea for ba basically overlapping a social encounter with a combat encounter, essentially. Uh, so I would I would definitely look at doing that for sure. But I, I got to look and see, is it worth for me, for example, to like throw together a swamp map and actually let the players have a combat encounter before the lizard folk show up? And or do I also want them to have a boat encounter? Just because it's a long way to go without an encounter, I think. I know we rolled this a bunch of times ago. We assume every hex is about a day of travel. There's, uh, I think, 120, or no, sorry, 60, 60 miles, which I, I think they can do 60 miles in a day on their ship. So that's solid one, two, three, four. Really, it's four and some change, so probably over four days of travel to get to Thornhold. And then I only rolled one encounter, which I think you're supposed to roll twice per day. So out of those eight or nine, I rolled one encounter, which was like floating debris or something. It wasn't even a combat encounter. 
So it depends on how close I want them to get to the Sawagan Stronghold before they land at the Swamp. Because the one thing I do like for encounters to do is to reflect the environment and what's going on there. And certainly it would make sense to have it be where if you were anywhere close to this Red Rocks region, then you would be attacked by Sawagan. Um, almost like an overwhelming force of Sawagan, which I don't know how to do that properly other than just saying, oh, you find all these giant sharks, you know, in the distance with Sawagan riding them and way more than you have of a ship. And they did see what one giant shark did to their ship. Like it did a good chunk of damage to where uh, they would not, that would be the big danger is like, we might be able to take out a lot of these Sawagan, but like these giant sharks are going to fuck up our ship possibly permanently. That's only if they get close, though. So maybe the Triton can warn them. But maybe, they, maybe they'll maybe they be heedless forward. I don't know. But I feel like we should have at least one combat thing happen before we get to the Sawagan Stronghold as a way of reflecting the danger level around the area. At max, it'll probably be one boat encounter with Sawagan plus one swamp encounter with something. I think, oh, you know, I should look up that creature they were talking about last time, because my roll 20 was fucked up last time. It was like Cavill Boss or something. Does anybody remember what that was? Uh, let's see. It's like Kato. That's what it is. I still don't know how to freaking pronounce it. C-A-T-O-B-L-E-P-A-S. I cannot pronounce that word. But it looks... Like some sort of weird swamp, swampasaurus. <laughs> it has like this death stare ability. Okay, it's a conglomeration of bloated buffalo, dinosaur, warthog, and hippopotamus. Okay, I accept that <laughs> description. A catablopus. Catablopus. My mouth does not want to say that word. It's like the syllables aren't <laughs> working. Wallowing in mire. It's a creature of disease and decay. Has the ghast stench uh, jacked up to a DC 16. A tail attack with a reach of 10 feet. It's a large monstrosity with 84 hit points. So this would be like a single monster fight, a CR5. And has a death ray that can fucking kill people. Which, you will know I've not been a huge fan of those kind of abilities. The tail attack can also stun. Now, the only bummer is this creature only has one attack around. And it only targets one creature with each attack. So, even though it's big and scary... Action economy is way against it. Attack does a plus 7 to hit. 5d6 plus 4 bludgeoning damage. Which is what, like 20 average damage? And can stun you with a dc16. Go on saving throw. The death ray, which is a recharge. Sorry, I know my thing's cutting it off right there. Oh, I can't scroll down any further. Uh, target one creature can see within 30 feet of it. Must make a DC 16 con save, taking 8d8 necrotic damage on a failed save or half as much on a successful one. If the saving throw fails by 5 or more, which is not something you see very often in 5e rules, the target instead takes maximum necrotic damage, 64 damage, and the target dies if reduced to 0 hit points, which is also adding insult to injury. Like, holy crap. <clears throat> I don't know what kind of tactics. Well, I'll say this, Mad. The one, the one bit of tactics I was going to use was to combine the floating debris with a Sawagan encounter, basically. So, like, it would be a classic. Um, I don't know, like, you know, uh, The Last of Us did this. Some other stuff, like, like, like where you you're in a dangerous environment and there's somebody who like needs help, so you stop to help them, and that's when you get jumped by the bad guys, kind of a situation. I might be able to try to do that here, where maybe the Sawagan have uh, taken out a ship recently or, or something where they the players see like just some folks, uh, or maybe like one person like, you know, meekly hanging on to, or maybe, maybe it's a dead body in the party, but the 
players don't know that and they're just slowing down to like check out this destruction and flotsam everywhere and uh that's when they slow down and the sawagan like come up from um you know underneath and climb the ship and try to attack it but the sawagan are not stupid in this case and they would realize very quickly i think the party is actually much stronger and more better equipped than most ships you know most ships aren't full of mid to high level adventurers and they would probably uh i might be able to do something where the sawagan are also trying to escape and warn the others that like this ship is coming that's a lot stronger and they need like reinforcements or something. So maybe add even like a little bit of a ship uh, chase scene or I, you know, they're, they're going to get this new ballista installed on their ship. So I know they're going to be itching to use that. Cat Oblipus. Which you have to capitalize one of the ones though when you do syllables. I don't know which... Where's the emphasis? <laughs> Otherwise, I just say it like a robot. Cat oblipus. <laughs> Is it cat oblipus? Or cat oblipus? Or cat oblipus? Or cat oblipus? <laughs> those, are, those are your options, basically. Uh, a, definitely a funky creature that we've never used before in D&D. So if I ever were to use it, maybe a good case of it. Uh, also, I think, yeah, Monster Manual Expanded 2 added some baby versions, some calves, so that could help uh, break up the action economy a little bit. Maybe they fight these little creatures, although these also have the death rays. They're just, everything's scaled down. Yeah, they have all the same abilities, but they've just been Scaled down, but the fact that it still has the, if you fail it by five or more, max necrotic damage, and then dies or produced to zero hit points by this ray. Like, straight up dies. That's fucking crazy. I guess if somebody gets hit by that, you could have lizard folk be like, all right, well, we can, I don't know, we have, we have the technology, we can rebuild them. <laughs> like a robot, is how I say it. <laughs> there is no emphasis there. Could make it a not necessarily common encounter. Yeah. Have you met my players though? Come on. Everything is a potential combat encounter. That is fun. Maybe they just like see them. Are they? Yeah, they are unaligned. They're not necessarily just out for destruction. Maybe I could do something fun, like introduce like the baby calf, like rising, like being in the middle of the swamp and like making a braying sound or something. The players are like, what do we do with this thing? And and then you have like, yeah, overprotective mother may not be too far away. Normally docile. There's a monstrous version, which I assume, I think it's creepy looking. That looks more like a horse. With a long neck and a person demon head. That's a CR 10 version of the creature, which is just everything scaled up and has multi attack. Alright, well, I don't necessarily want to go that crazy with it, I think. It's a common encounter until that death ray kills Gotwald. It's a con save, though. Like, Gotwald will be the. should be the most protected one with the best con saves. God, 96 necrotic damage on the monstrous version. And the target dies reduced to zero hit points by this ray. That's if they fail to save by five or more, which that save is a DC 19. My God. It, this could be the one that the, uh, the lizard folk uh, come into though, right? In the middle of the Catoblipus. <laughs> Catoblipus. I need to watch. Is there anybody else that, that does D&D videos that has used this creature that has to say it out loud? Because <laughs> I, I don't want to be the only idiot out here that is completely fumbling how to pronounce this creature. Some milk can be made into an exquisite cheese. 
That's true. Uh, Nate, you could have... That's true. You could do a reverse situation, right? Where you, they, they could be st stumbling through the swamp and and actually tracking the lizard folk successfully because Lord knows we have not actually had Mac be able to use his ranger tracking skills. So that might be a fun thing to do, in which case, you know, you, you almost just let him roll it, but you're just like, all right, well, you're going to find your way through the swamp because you're a ranger, <laughs> right? Like, that's the weird thing about ranger. It's like, oh, well... You want to reward them for it, but like all our things are like, you can just do it. So we could like successfully track his way through the swamp. We could turn it into a whole thing. And then they come across lizard folk having to battle like this creature or something. And that could be kind of spiff. Now, in that case, there wouldn't even be much of a combat encounter because this thing only can attack one person around. Unless I change that. <laughs> Or maybe that's when I jack up and use the monstrous catoblipus if I wanted to. Where's this one from? That's a CR12 version. Poison Breath. It's a much different thing. This is from Kingmaker Bestiary. Is that Pathfinder? We could throw some calves in there, though. So that might be a more interesting encounter if it's the players actually coming across lizard folk first and they get a chance to save lizard folk then that would help maybe ingratiate them with the tribe and put on some fun relations instead of me unnecessarily ambushing the party especially since i'm just about to or I'm preceding that i will probably try to ambush the party with the sawagan fighting force which also we'll probably end up talking about that on thursday is what actual Sawagan to throw at the party because I've got lots of different options and I want to try, try to balance that between not using just the basic really low level Sawagan stat block but also not creating like a huge death killer you know encounter patrol or something but I've got lots of options when it comes to Sawagan stats remember a crocodile with tentacles I think from Ruins of Mesro called a mud mob but I don't think it's official Crocodile with tentacles. I feel like you could add tentacles to a lot of monsters and make them pretty interesting. Fortunately, I can't search by biome, I don't think. When it comes to the filters, you can search by type, which would just be like beast or monstrosity. And then CR rating, I guess you could always search for unaligned, which would give you kind of neutral type creatures and constructs. Actually see what that looks like to search unaligned. Could be a single lizard folk runner carrying info back to the main force. Yeah, that's true. Well, that's, I was almost thinking about how to use Thousand Teeth also, which is, uh, which maybe we could even apply Thousand Teeth like legendary actions to this Catoblopus. I don't know. You guys are dead set on using that creature, but uh, I don't know. I still kind of like Thousand Teeth as a mega croc. So yeah, Unaligned gives you, well, it's too many things. Too many things. A bunch of Drakes apparently Unaligned. Onk eggs, giant ants, arcane ballista. It's, yeah, this is there's too many creatures out there. An awakened tree. Just fight a giant fucking tree. Well, I need to look that up then, was right. Official D&D pronunciation of name. You can look it up there. I know I had to look up uh, whenever I reviewed a product called Wrath of Zugatmoy. I had to look up how to pronounce Zugatmoy. <laughs> and thankfully, I found a YouTube video of the official D&D folks talking about that particular demon. Or devil? I don't remember if she's a demon or devil. Um, I have not had them talking about the Catoblipus, though. Catoblipus. Catos. Mudma. Let's try looking Mudma. I don't know if it's official either. 
Negative. Negative on there. Mega, Mega Croc versus Swamp Giraffe Pig Dino. Yeah, can I just show y'all the Mega Croc again? Where is that thing? It's in Chapter 3. It's a CR6 large monstrosity with 93 hit points. It's got multi-attack with bite and tail. It can knock people over with its tail. It's got legendary resistance. <clears throat> I guess it doesn't make sense why you'd be fighting this like random legendary crocodile, though. It's kind of... I feel like this would be like the end of an important quest or something, which it is in, in Danger at Dunwater. It's like, hey, go... It, actually, it's just a side quest in that campaign. But it's it's cool just to see a boss monster that's not like a typical boss monster. It's just like a modified crocodile. It's like, all right, let's give it legendary resistance. Let's give it multi-attack. Let's give it legendary actions. Like, fuck it. I like to see that. But yeah, I think I think I'm actually might be sold on this Octoblipus thing. So we'll need to add. And I think I might like the idea of the party. Uh, maybe coming across lizard folk already battling this thing as a way to show off like just how bad of a situation the lizard folk are in. The fact that they're having to just eke out their existence in this very highly dangerous swamp. It's a weird fucking creature. It's an effectively creepy token, though. So that plus the calves, which are for Monster Manual Expanded 2, which if you've not already done that, please watch my video on the entire Monster Manual Expanded series on Roll20, as well as my favorite uh, top 10 monsters from that series. The complaint is I don't like the way they did the token art on a lot of the Monster Manual Expanded books. They try to fit, like, the entire artwork on a single token which is just not good the better way to do it is how these guys do it right here where you can see like the portrait you know the actual face of the character that looks a lot better than trying to fit like too much art on one token so yeah i think having one of those plus a couple of the calves and all their death rays going off could be pretty freaky that could be just like downing lizard folk left and right just be like We've, we've and you know you could have a sad story like hey we've had to pick up our entire like you know camp and move it around because there's just so many swamp creatures and it's just been a pain in the ass i don't know how many to actually have around for lizard folk but enough where they could stage like a distracting battle for the party cuz there's no notes in ghost of salt marsh about how the party actually get to this unique, like, offshore rocky island dungeon that's, I think, I would assume, and I think you all agree with me, would be pat actively patrolled by the enemy inside said lair. They would not be just sitting in there, holed up, waiting for people to come invade them. And I'm making my swagger a lot more powerful, too, because they're, you know, uh, motivated slash religiously zealot Lisley Zealot Tree, uh, devoted to the Mind Flayers, who have kind of replaced Sekola as their new god, and I just realized that there's a whole thing about Sekola's like Ma or something in the temple. I'll have to figure that out. Old gods die hard. But they should be out patrolling, controlling the area, and really threatening the whole Sword Coast. And I, I want to have the party like really deal a pretty good blow to the these evil aquatic creatures, which have all fallen under sway of the Mind Flayers, the Illithid, or the Illithid, as Baldur's Gate seems to pronounce them, and take them out of the equation. 
Just hooked up my 65 inch OLED to my PC. I got Eric in 4K HDR. <laughs> I am so large and in charge. <laughs> That's amazing. I am honored. What's the recharge on the death ray? I want to say it's a five to six, so 33% chance. Yeah. So definitely can't do it every round. But when it does do it, oh boy. Uh, do you all, when you see these abilities, do you make them recharge in the beginning? Or do they always have one in the chamber? And then when they use it, then you start recharging. Because that could be another way that you balance it. Is you make them recharge from the very beginning of the fight. I don't think that's how it's designed to be. I don't think that's rules as intended. Or maybe it is written. I think you always start with them being able to use their big ability right off the bat. And then after you use it, then you have to actually recharge it. But I've always thought about that being an interesting, like, I don't know, method of balance and maybe leaving it a little more up to RNG. I could always take out some of these factors if I want to, if I'm too much of a wuss. I could take out the target dies, which is zero hit points, or even if the saving throw fails by five or more, target set takes 64 necrotic damage. But it's also fun to just see that. <laughs> Sweeping across that thing and be like, yeah. Although the bummer is, if I do it against somebody that's not the player, and then I show this ability, then they're like, oh, fuck. We know what we have. Like, it, it kind of takes away some of the shock of factor, right? Because everything is is public in Roll20 when we, when we roll for it. So you could argue I might need to hide some of that ability just to keep things interesting. Fighting lizard folk, I'd say not charged when an NPC dead already from it. Yeah, that's true. So you're basically it's like starting in the middle of the fight. So it's already used the ability. Make sure it's set up correctly. This is not that scary. Unless you fail it by five or more, which is interesting. I don't know... That's an interesting design that I haven't seen too much in 5e, where it's like thresholds of failing. Oh, God, what was that book that I reviewed that had a similar system to it? Where it was like, it was specifically with saving throws for spells. In fact, I think it redid all the spells to say if you, there was such thing as like a partial fail versus like a full fail or something. And it kind of applied to the system where it was like, hey, if you, like if you cast hold person and somebody makes the save. Oh, that's what it was. If you made the save but didn't make it by five or more, then you got like a partial success on them. So maybe they didn't get paralyzed, but they got, I don't know, incapacitated for like a single turn or something. That was actually a really interesting system. It seemed like it would break a lot of the rules uh, foundation, but I did think it was interesting the way that you could change how spells work because it does feel bad if somebody just makes a save. On the other hand, though, Spellcaster is already so fucking powerful in 5e, so... <laughs> Do we really need to make them even more stronger? By letting them get some love from it. I, I feel like you would need to, like, bake those kind of rules into an edition of D&D, though, instead of modulating them on on top of rules already, because that's that seems like a big thing that you would have to balance for. Alright, so I think... I think we've settled on a Sawagan ship encounter and a swamp encounter. Do we want to even fuck around with using Thornhold or not? I mean, it's on the map. They're probably going to ask about it unless we want to go around it somehow. Too many windows. So Thornhold is just right here. I mean, it's pretty obvious. And I can move this quest marker wherever I want. But it's just a castle full of dwarves, I believe. Obviously, I could change that. Where are you? Chapter 3. Uh, locations. Thornhold. I don't know why it shows a... Cavern map here, an icy cavern. 
Thornhold is a coastal fortress on the southern tip of the Mare of Dead Men. Uh, associated with Waterdeep. Travelers are free to visit Thornhold up to a point. The dwarves allow caravans to make camps in their walls. Forbid access to the keep and extensive caves below. So as written, I think they would might allow lizard folk in there, or they would be shitty to them and be like, no, you gotta go into the swamp. There's no room for you here. There's a whole encounter about being mistaken for stealing a magic item that just kind of, I don't see the reason to use that. So the only thing I could do with Thornhold is it's a it's a place for them to dock their ship, I guess. It's a coastal fortress that it would be a place for them to dock their ship. Um and maybe the Triton has can provide uh you know, she's maybe maybe she's already met with maybe her job was to meet at Thornhold because they sent out I gotta, I gotta figure this out. <laughs> Somehow, the party will maybe know to go to Thornhold first, and then that that way they can dock their ship in a safe place, and then at Thornhold they can be told, yeah, the, but the lizard folk, uh, you know, we they're just they're too much. We didn't have room for them. You know, classic refugee crisis problem. We, there's just no room. Uh, we told them they had to go out to the swamp. And they did, and then that's when the party has to track them down. Uh, they have the Catoblepus encounter. They meet the lizard folk, and that's when they really get the full rundown of the extent of the problem, of the situation. They get the maps, those handouts, and then they're told like, "All right, well, here's a plan that we have, but if you have a different plan." Then go for it, but we're just trying to get you guys inside there because and, and the players are motivated here because they just want to rescue people, right? Like Mac, one one of his like beloved NPCs has been captured, and a bunch of people from Neverwinter were captured, and probably a lot of people from like Waterdeep, like a whole bunch of people are being captured by the Sawagan for the Mind Flayers. But also just taking out the Sawagan threat and knowing where their base of operations here is gonna be a huge advantage uh for the players on their road to defeating the bad guys. And then Red Rocks is a whole danger thing with like even trying to navigate in the waters here would be very strong. In fact, I can have the Swagon attacking them as they're nearing Thornhold. And then as they finally make their way into Thornhold, those the people in there will be like, yeah, we can't, like, we're able to fortify our position here. They can't really make headway into the swamp, but they don't really care about that either. They're just, they want to control the seas. Um, and then we've seen them coming and going and just there's nothing we can really do. We're holding out here and there's just not much you know just not much thornholds can basically do they've like whatever navy they had was quickly destroyed by the sawagan or something which they probably didn't have too much i think they're mainly there to just help create a foothold into the swamp so it'll be a lot of story stuff but that's what I wanted to punctuate with some with some combat with the sawagan and this cantablopus which maybe depending on how much that sawagan fight goes we might be able to actually get through all of this on Friday, right? Although we have a level up, which takes some time, but we're going to go like all the way to the Sawagat encounter next, basically, because I'm not doing a bunch of other stuff. Uh, that into Thornhold, and then that into the Swamp, and the Swamp will be kind of a partial encounter, but not really a full one. I think the Lizard Folk will already be there, and we can have fun doing a, you know, kind of ally fighting a thing encounter, which could be nice. And then... Uh, Probably end it right there and then begin the following session, perhaps with the actual social encounter with the lizard folk, and then involve actually infiltrating the first level of uh, the Sawagan stronghold. And then we'll be actually in the dungeon at that point. So we could even make it to like, you know, almost halfway through the next session before we're actually in that dungeon, which I do have an awesome, awesome map ready to go, uh, which we will talk more about on Thursday, but also for the next couple of weeks uh, from Richard Bear Gardner, an awesome uh, patron fan of the show who has a map artist and provided some amazing maps for basically all the Ghosts of Saltmarsh content that I've done, Sinister Secret, uh, Salvage Operation, and now uh, Final Enemy. So I'll have to put some dynamic lighting on this map and all the tokens and all that fun stuff, but that's okay because... It's a lot easier than me trying to come up with some uh, some map art. So huge shout out to Bear.
All right, I think that is going to do it for this Monday edition of Crafting the Deep. As always, if you enjoy the content, please do check out patreon.com slash roguewatson. Shoutouts to Platinum Patrons, Joe, Will, Thomas, Stan, Brandon, Genocide, Eclectic, Roleplay, Roll, Christopher, Corey, Big Nut, John F., John L., Eric, Tyler, Nathan, Camp Crystal, Counselor, Andrew, Daryl, The Relder, and Captain Woody, 79, Stephanie, Andy, Patrick, Jason, Ismail, Ahmet, Lumpy, Spud, Sharni, David, and William, and Gold Park Patrons, excuse me, RPG Papergrafts, Pretty Boy and Yuma, the Lizard Lion, Sam, Drome, Nathan, Fast Like a Tortoise, Scott, Refus, Carolyn, Jerry, Glenn, Marcus, and Mark. Thank you all very much for your support. I will see you all again for another crafting episode on Thursday. <laughs>